Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Look around you. There's so much work to do. This world is in no condition for us to simply sit back and watch. There is a tangible, desperate need for Jesus. A glimpse of hope in the midst of hopelessness. Jesus experienced this. He saw it firsthand. The need broke his heart and filled him with compassion. He turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This alone should stir our hearts. It's a calling, a calling to make a difference, to share the truth of the gospel, to be a light in the darkness, to be the church. It's time for us to look beyond ourselves, to turn our focus to the field, to answer the call and passionately share the love of Jesus. This is our mandate. This is our mission. Are you ready to do the work? Good morning, Christ Community Church. Well, that was a lot better. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, I just want to say thank you for your continued prayers for me. Um, last time I was up here, I was still kind of hobbling around. For those of you that know, I was in a, in a pretty significant accident um, a few months ago. I've made a full recovery now. Um, I'm probably doing better now than I was prior to the accident. I started working out. Shout out to the guys at Barbenders for uh, really getting me on track with that. I'm actually down 20 pounds, so if you guys are looking for a gym, Barbenders is the place to go. Thank you. All right, so I'm kicking off Philippians. Um, we're going to be in Philippians 1, verses 1 through 26. And before we get into that, we need a kind of flashback to Acts. Now, if you remember when Scott and Matt was preaching through Acts not too long ago, we kind of kind of see where Paul was going. So Paul is actually on his second missionary journey. He goes to the city of Philippi, and he meets three people while he's there that he kind of lets spearhead the church. First, he meets Lydia. Um, she was probably from Asia. She was very rich, very wealthy. She sold purple dye, purple goods. She would be like a, a fashion CEO. She would be like the owner of of Prada or Gucci or something of our time now. And then we see as we progress through the story of Acts that there was a possessed slave girl, a young girl that was running around and giving Paul and all the guys a hard time. And he was kind of kind of fed up with it. He told the evil spirit to leave her, and it did, and, and she inevitably came to Christ. And then Paul was, Paul was arrested, he was thrown in jail. And while he was in jail, the jailer really done a number on him, really beat him up. And as we see in the story of Acts, a, a great earthquake had happened, and all the jail cells opened up. And the, the jailer wakes up, and he thinks all his prisoners have escaped, so he panics, and he's going to kill himself. And Paul says, no, no, hold up, we're, we're all still here. And now the, the man that was beating Paul to a pulp prior is now coming to Christ because Paul shares the gospel with him. And as, as the story in Acts unfolds, we see very, three very different walks of life come together and spearhead the church in Philippi. And it's important to note the drastic differences not only in their demeanor, but their background and how they carry themselves, all which have melted together to form the church there. The, the power of the gospel is at work. And I got a, I got a quote in our bulletin here from, from Matt Chandler. And he says, the gospel cannot be stopped by socioeconomic, racial, or religious walls, we fallen humans have built up. In these incredible instances, the gospel defies race, defies class, defies status, and even defies aptitude. Now Matt's talking about in Acts, but I think that still holds true today, does it not? 
So, to get into Philippians, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church that, you know, he set forth with the jailer, with Lydia, with the, with the possessed slave girl. And scholars, most of them believe that this was written in 62 AD in Rome. Now, there are some speculations that Paul wrote this either in Caesarea or Ephesus, which they all have their pros and cons as to where Paul wrote it. But at the end of the day, we know that Paul wrote this letter. It was going to the Philippians, and Paul wrote it while he was in prison. So when I was told that I was going to be preaching on the first 26 verses, you know, I went home and I read it. My first pass, I was thinking, man, this is kind of, kind of lackluster. You know, I, I read Jonah 4, and it really hit me like a ton of bricks. But reading this, it really wasn't hitting me. You know, I just see the, the typical Paul greeting. He's greeting in the church. He goes about his way. It's kind of long-winded. No real substance. I mean, there's some stuff peppered in, but not a, not a lot going on. And as I read it, I thought, you know, come on, Paul. You need to, you need to get to the good stuff. I really need something to get these people fired up. Or at least something that will make them hit the buckets pretty hard. So at least Scott thinks I've done a good job today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the more I read the more I realized Paul doesn't just write to ramble on. Every word has great intent. So I told my wife on day one of reading Philippians, I was like, you know, Paul's got to get it together. I really need something. And day 15 of reading, I realized I could spend hours and hours just on the first few verses because, I mean, there is so much packed into that. So rather than keeping you guys here till supper time, I'm going to condense this down and give you a shotgun message. And uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground. So Hopefully you guys can keep up with me. You guys can take something from this. So the more I read this, I realized Paul's greeting actually does stand out. You know, Paul typically comes in, he announces himself in his letters, and then he'll spend the next umpteen chapters just tearing into the church and telling them, you know, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to fix. But we don't see that in Philippians. So what we can gather from that is the Philippians are a pretty mature church, or they're a maturing church. You know, they, they kind of have it together. And most churches will read this and think, hey, you know, we're like the Philippians. We got it together. And lucky for us at Christ Community, we do. Or at least we like to think so, right? And I think, I think we do do a pretty good job, but, you know, I feel like if Paul would write us a letter, you know, he would tell us all the good things that we're, we're doing well. And I think he would give us a nice kick in the pants on stuff we need to work on, and sometimes we, uh, we need that. But jumping right into verse 1, Paul addresses himself and Timothy as servants. Now, it, it's interesting, Paul's not saying like a household servant or a housemaid. Um, a more accurate translation would be slave. And like Matt talked about last week, you know, we have to look past the idea of slave that we saw here in America many, many years ago. Slaves during this time were either prisoners of war that that they took in and made slaves, or or a slave was more or less someone that sold themselves into like a welfare system. They got three square meals, they they had a place to live, they had a job, and they could inevitably buy themselves out of slavery. But, and then we see in the Old Testament that being a slave of God held was was a title of honor. We see that with Moses, Joshua, and David. But Paul's not referring to himself in that, in that context. If you look at it in the Greco-Roman context, Paul is writing, it, it has an undeniable overtone of humility and submission, meaning that Paul is a slave to Christ, that he is indebted to Christ, and he will lower himself to serve his master. And right there, Paul is already setting the tone for what it means to be a follower of Christ. Then Paul moves forward, and he addresses the recipients as saints in Christ Jesus or God's holy people. Now, this is a reminder for those in Philippi that they are united as one, not from their own doing, but the work of God. And once again, we, we look back to those at who Paul left in charge of the church. We have very three distinct individuals, and they were kind of dealing with some disunity in the, in the church of Philippi. So Paul is reminding them that you are united through Christ, not by what you've done yourselves. So, moving forward to verse 6, and this is, this is a pretty powerful verse. Verse 6 says that, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now, that's a pretty, pretty powerful verse. If you guys were here for ordination of the boys a couple weeks ago, Ralph Clay actually quoted this 
You know, this verse gives us Christians great hope, especially those of us who have felt distant from God or feel like we're in doubt or we feel like we're in a spiritual drought. And I'm kind of kind of go off on a tangent here, but this verse really, really helped me in a, in a very strange time in my faith. You know, I, I spoke a couple weeks ago during the ordination of the boys that I was sitting in class and I just had this great epiphany that I didn't need to be in class anymore and I needed to spread the gospel. And I ended up dropping out of art school and I joined the guys at Chook and we, we started playing shows and reaching kids that the church wasn't reaching and sharing the gospel to a bunch of uh, punks and, and hood rats that wouldn't normally come to church. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, wasn't working a real job. I was just managing the band. So I'd get up every morning and I'd start my day with an hour of prayer and start with an hour of reading. And I just felt on fire for God. And, you know, a year went by and I finally was back into school and, and trying to do the band stuff and, and working. And I just felt really distant from God. And that whole time that I was with the band, I was riding this spiritual high. I felt, felt on fire, but you know, life was coming at me from all directions. I kind of felt like I lost that. And it took me years to realize that there's a difference in an emotional response and genuine faith. And this verse really nailed that down. So in the times that I felt distant from God and I didn't feel like I was on fire anymore, I could look back to verse one six, or Philippians 1, 6 and know that God started a good work in me, which is the work of salvation, and he will follow that through. And I think it's very important to note that, you know, there will be times where we have that emotional high in Christianity, but sometimes, you know, we'll feel that emotional low, but at the end of the day, God's work is still being done in our lives. Now, it's important to note that verse 6 doesn't mean everything's going to be rainbow and gumdrops. You know, our plans may not always pan out. We may even have plans that we think is going to further the kingdom, but, and we think, you know, everything's going well, but sometimes God has different plans. What Paul is saying here is that the work of the gospel, our salvation, will be fulfilled. And once again, that's not by our own hands, our own doing, but that is by what God has done. Now, that being said, if, if we are truly Christians, we should be maturing. We should be drawing closer to God. We should be becoming more Christ-like. We should be fulfilling the Great Commission, which is sharing the gospel. And Lord willing, he will see us through to the end of that and all the, all the things that he has set before us. Genuine spiritual progress is rooted in what God has done, is doing, and what he will do. And that doesn't mean we're going to be free from stumbling or struggling. We may even fail. But we can be confident in the fact that God will not let us go. And we, we see that again in, in Romans 9.38. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And just because we may feel abandoned at times in our life, that doesn't mean that we are. Moving on to verses 7 and 8, Paul's talking about his imprisonment. And, I mean, if I was in, in prison, I think I'd be pretty beat down, but Paul's finding, finding great joy, especially in the Philippians, because he sees that they are continuing the, the work of Christ. And the, and the Philippians, they supported Paul in and out of prison. Imprisonment would be very shameful during that time. You know, we even, even see that today. If someone comes out of prison and they're trying to get their life back on track, you know, they have that on their record, and most places tend to shy away from them. And this would have been magnified, you know, greatly. So Paul would have kind of been shoved aside, and, and the Philippians stuck with him through it, through thick and thin. And this has practical implications for us today. Um, you know, unfortunately, people tend to lose sight of this, and, and they want to jump ship when the, when the church doesn't cater their wants. Um, you know, they, they church hop until they find the church that has the right music or the right donuts or the right coffee. And Paul's implications here is that we, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't find a church that, you know, checks off all these boxes. But if we're not spiritually growing in that church, you know, there's, there's something to be said. Faithfulness to the church and its divinely called leadership should be tied should not be tied to such worldly definitions of success, such as physical facilities, numerical growth, a comfortable lifestyle, 
and impressive credentials. This passage challenges the modern Christian to look beyond what is seen and focus on the heart and to remain faithful to the church, its leadership, and the missionaries, even when, in the world's view, they look like failures. So this this goes back to the idea of what it looks like to be a maturing Christian rather than running at the sight of opposition or confrontation or even expectation of what it means to be a Christian that we band together. We support the church and its leaders that God has placed in our lives to teach us or lead us in worship or, or whatever the case may be. That, that means that you stick around whether we have donuts or not. That we support the, the boys in Uganda whether they move mountains for the kingdom or not. That means that whether we bring one heck of a sermon or, or one that's lackluster, you still take your preacher out to lunch. Isn't that right, Scott? <laughs> so, moving on to verses 9 through 11, we see this continuation of maturity. Paul's hope that their love continues to grow more and more and to be accompanied by knowledge and discernment. This means to express love wisely in a way that will be beneficial to others and to glorify God. You know, Matt's always had a saying that's kind of kind of stuck with me. He says that stupid for Jesus is still stupid. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way to handle things, even as Christians, and I think we're all guilty of the latter. You know, we have to have that spiritual discernment. We have to show love in a way that is, is compassionate and doesn't come off the wrong way. Furthermore, Paul hopes that the Philippians to be pure and blameless and to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's not expecting us to be perfect. You know, we, we will we'll never achieve that. However, we are to continually to strive to be more like Christ each and every day. It is a continual progression, it, not by our own doing, but by the renewal of the Spirit, which will ultimately glorify God. This is the process of sanctification. You grow closer to God. You become more Christ-like. In verses 12 through 18, Paul brings up the advancement of the gospel. You know, the Philippians would have been grieving over Paul's imprisonment, even though his trials, he offers words of encouragement. He points, he points out that though his circumstances may not be that great, the, the furthering of the proclamation of the gospel is still going strong. And his joy in difficult circumstances is meant to be an example to the Philippians to likewise rejoice in difficult times. Not so much that, you know, you're going through a tough time, but knowing that you can use that tough time to run to the cross and lead by example and follow through with what it means to be a Christian and share your faith during those difficult times. And we see... As, as Paul describes through his imprisonment, that there are others finding courage to speak more boldly about their faith in Jesus Christ. And, and back again to a, a level of solidarity that, you know, the Philippians had with Paul, now we see that same solidarity with, with other Christians. They see that Paul's in prison, and they see how courageous he is in spreading the gospel while in prison. They're becoming more bold in their faith, and they're more apt to speak out. And I think the same could be said about us. You know, when we see someone, you know, really going through it, really struggling, and we see that their faith is still just as strong as the day before, you know, whatever's afflicting them, you know, that kind of gives us that courage to, to be bold and to take heart in our own faith. Now, verse 15, you know, this one's always kind of throwing me for the loop. You know, Paul talks about those preaching out a rivalry or to make things more difficult for him, but the gospel still being proclaimed, and he can find joy in that. Now, this isn't the equivalent of Paul taking joy in something that, that may be heretical, because we know in, in Paul's other letters, if something is heretical, Paul's no stranger to calling him out for it and nipping it in the bud pretty quick. When, when Paul is re- referring to those that are, are preaching out of envy or rivalry, he is referring to people that were probably at odds with him. You know, they're, they're preaching a sound gospel, but, but these people may have dismissed him, dismissed him as a person. You know, he's been in prison. They could be rubbing it in like, you know, you're in prison, I'm outside of prison. You know, you must not be doing it well enough. Or 
Paul mentions in, in 1 Corinthians that he has poor speaking ability, so they might be, you know, rubbed it in that, you know, I'm a way better public speaker, I'm way better than Paul, you might have it together, but, you know, I can, I can preach better than you can. And similarly, it would look like for us, you know, a church down the street that, that's preaching the word truthfully, but, you know, may not see eye to eye with things that we do, or and they might get bent out of shape because we're doing this or we're not doing that, or they're upset that we have Ralph Clay, and for that, I don't blame them. <laughs> but, or, or they, they may agree with, with close-handed issues because they are preaching a sound gospel, but they may take a different stance on open-handed issues. And what I mean by that is open-handed are things that aren't crucial to salvation. So whether you believe in free will or predestination, and if you ask Paul which of those were right, he would say both. Or if you believe that the earth is 5,000 years old or 5 billion years old, you know, those things aren't crucial to salvation. But what, what is a close-handed issue is that we're all sinners, we all need saving, and we can't do it ourselves. So God sent Jesus, born of a virgin, to live a perfect, sinless life that went to the cross on our behalf and suffered the wrath of God and all who believe in him shall have everlasting life. And then Jesus was resurrected, and we know that Jesus will be returning. Those are close-handed issues. That's something that we don't budge on. Now, there is things that we can debate about, but at the end of the day, we shouldn't be getting in fistfights and arguments about these open-handed issues. Because at, at the end of the day, we know that that church is preaching a sound gospel, and people are coming to faith by it. And on the other side, that we, we shouldn't look at other churches in envy or disdain. You know, we, we may see, you know, a mega church that's, you know, got thousands of members and they're bringing in all this money and they're doing all these great works, you know, but we know that the gospel is being preached here and we know that people are coming to Christ here and we should find rejoice and joy in, in that. Now, moving into Philippians 19 through 26 to live as Christ, to die as gain. Now, things really start heating up, and, and this is what really, really moved me as I was, I was reading through this. In verse 19 and 20, Paul is requesting a prayer of deliverance, and it's interesting to note the ambiguity here. You know, Paul could be referring to his deliverance from prison or his deliverance in, in salvation. Nonetheless, he says, his hope through either life or death that he will not be ashamed of the gospel that he's been preaching. And this leads us to the infamous verse 21, to live as Christ, to die as gain. And that's a pretty powerful verse, is it not? You know, Paul isn't seeking his own comfort or advancement of himself, but yet that of the gospel. For Paul to die it would alleviate him of his troubles here on earth, and he would be in the presence of Christ. But to live is to continue the work of Christ. Now, that's some powerful faith, to live as Christ to die is gain. You know, my, my grandmother, my Mamma Ruby, she lived and breathed that verse every day of her life. You know, she, made, she grew up in the church. She made sure all her children grew up in the church. She made sure all her grandchildren, all her great-grandchildren. And up until the day she died, she was highly involved in her church and, and prayer chains and really just trying to glorify the kingdom. And I remember not too long before she passed, she was on some blood thinners, and something as simple as a paper cut could have been very catastrophic for her. And I know one evening she had a terrible nosebleed, and she couldn't get it to stop, so she, you know, just plugged her nose and went down, lay down, and went to bed. And the next morning, my, my aunt walks in through the back door and into the kitchen and sees the, the bloody napkins in the trash can. She runs in, and she said, Mom, you, you really should have called somebody. You know, you, you could have died. And she turned to her and said, I knew if it was my time, I would have woke up in the presence of the Lord. But if it wasn't, I was going to wake up in the morning and continue my work here. You know, hearing that story so close to home really has been a tremendous crutch in my times of struggle in my faith and my hope and prayer one day is to have that level of faith. And I, I think we should all strive to have that level of faith that we can look death in the face and say the worst thing that can happen to me is I wake up in the presence of my Savior. But while I'm here, I'm going to pick up my cross 
and do what Christ has called me to do. And in verses 22 through 26, Paul really unpacks what he says in verse 21. In verse 22, he says that if I'm to live, that means more fruitful labor for me, more fruitful labor for the kingdom. And Paul goes on to talk about his desires being torn between wanting to be with Christ and wanting to stay. But he knows being with Christ is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for their account. And he says, I'm convinced of this. I know I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith. Now, I'm by no means a a Paul, but I feel a slight similarity in what Paul is saying in my own personal experience. Like I mentioned before, you know, the accident I was involved in just three months prior was was pretty detrimental. And I'm not going to get into the specifics, but there were a number of factors that were in play that, that kept me alive during that and kept me from bleeding out. You know, the ambulance was at the right place at the right time. And, and, you know, if the truck, if I would have pulled out just a few inches more, you know, it could have been, could have been deadly. And there, there was a few moments after the accident where I didn't think I was going to make it, but at the end of the day, I, I essentially walked away. I didn't have any neck or back trauma. I didn't have any head trauma. You know, I had some issues with my legs and I'm standing up here before you today. And, and since then, I've been able to preach two weekends now. I've, I've got to teach the kids a few times, you know, upstairs and back in the galaxy. I've been able to pour the gospel into my brother that was once an atheist. I was able to witness to people out on the mail route that are struggling with trying to figure out what Christianity is about. Like Paul, I'm convinced that there's a reason I'm still here, and I praise the Lord that I am. So, to summarize what we went over, Verses 1 through 26 really lay a lot of groundwork for us. You know, Paul puts it in perspective of of what it means to to serve Christ, to submit to our Lord right from the rip. And then we see that God will finish the good work of salvation that he has started in us. And we can hold on to that hope and know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can take our salvation away from us. Then we, sh- then we see that we should be faithful to the church and, and its leaders that God has placed in our lives. God has planted us in this church. God has divinely put this leadership before you so that you may grow in your faith. Then we see that a maturing Christian shows love alongside knowledge and discernment and that it should be a continual progression toward Christ. And if you take a moment and self-examine and if you don't feel like you're growing closer to Christ. You don't feel like you're maturing. You know, we, we have the Bible, we have the book of Philippians to really ha- as a, serve as a guidepost, as, a, as an outline to get ourselves back on track. And then ultimately we see that the advancement of the gospel cannot be stopped. Paul was in prison and the gospel was still spreading like wildfire. And we should use every opportunity to advance the kingdom, whether you know, we're in the best situation or not, we should always strive to share the gospel day in and day out. And lastly, we should have faith so strong that we can boldly say to live is Christ, to die is gain, so that we can stare death in the face without fear. Now, that's where I'm leaving off. We're going to pick up with the the end of chapter one next week. Church, if you'll bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that we are able to come together as a congregation here. Lord, I pray that as we progress as a church, I pray that we become more mature. I pray that we all boldly proclaim our faith and make disciples of, of many people. Lord, I pray that you'll give us the strength to Have the faith as as Paul did to live as Christ, to die as gain. And Lord, I pray that if there was something that I that I said up here this morning that is contrary to your word, that it falls on deaf ears. But Lord, if I spoke any ounce of truth, that it weighs heavy on the hearts, minds, and souls of each and every one of us, myself included, so that we can see a genuine progression in our faith. It's your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Christ Community Church. We'll see you back next week.
Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.